All right, guys. So we are here for the Rivian earnings call. Let me make sure you guys can see. Um, there you go. Make sure you can hear the audio. Let's see what Rivian does. Let me drink my tea. That's not my tea. I'm pretty sure Rivian is going to drop them as soon as the bell ends. Let me let me make sure. Let me pull Benzinga up. We have Bobby here. How's it going, guys? Um, All right, we got three minutes. Obviously, I got a YOLO on my account right before right. the closing bell. Three minutes, dude. There's a lot you can get done in three minutes, bro. That's you what know? I'm saying. Money minutes. <laughs> yeah, dude. You know, shoot for a thousand dollars a minute, you know. That's uh, what I'm saying. That's what a real trader does. Right. <laughs> Always, bro. Uh, yeah, so fourth quarter earnings are supposed to be dropping after market close. Uh, so we're just kind of waiting for that. I'm going to put the banner up. What's up, BS? What's up, Rush? Hey, good, good evening. I always say good morning, but I'm used to saying good morning, so we'll have to say good evening for this one. And we'll see. We also got Oracle earnings that are dropping, too. Um, if Oracle earnings are early, then I can maybe manage that and then switch over to uh, switch over afterwards. All right, so after market close today, Rivian's coming out. Oracle is dropping their earnings call same time, so it'll be same time. It'll be competing. But we'll review both of these, both Oracle and Rivian earnings to see what we get. We're definitely really early for Rivian's earnings, but that's okay. Better to be early than never. Better to be early than late for the most part. Yeah, for sure. You know. 100%. Yeah, but Rivian just dove down, man. So Rivian just got beat up today. Honestly, I feel like I should have kept pushing, dude, to be honest. Like, I'm, I'm still kind of bummed because today the market trended fairly well. It wasn't perfect by any means. But, like, there were some really nice shorts to get involved with, I think, uh, right around, like, 1030 market time, right when I closed mm -hmm. it down. I just think there were some powerful shorts to get involved with. And it maintained that downward trend until like 1.30. So we had like a full three hours of just straight downward trend, respecting the VWAP, easy to short into little pops and just capitalize on it. But we ended green. And I think that's that's all I can really ask for, I think, you know. Um, all right, so let's see. Let's do a poll here real quick. Are you bullish or bearish on Rivian? Yep. Head of earnings. Uh, are you bullish on Rivian with fourth uh, with Q4 earnings dropping soon? They're dropping today. Rivian just tanked at market close. Dude, um, being bull. Rivian bear. Let me know which one you guys are. I can. You can still get in with like, what is it? <laughs> limit orders and all that right uh so limit orders no market orders right now so as soon as the bell rings you can only mm -hmm. hit you can only get it with limit orders um uh, and so it the question is the real question i think with this one is how extended is rivian on the downside now you know and uh, even if earnings are bad how much of this pre-earnings move is already baked into this current level right so it's like okay well even if it, this is one of those scenarios where even if rivian has bad earnings they might go up some just because they're so extended on the downside after today. You know, they just kind of got beat up. Um, and so the question is, and they've really just gotten hammered over the last like month's time, less than a month, last three weeks uh, since about the 28th of February, they have just dove down. They're all the way down to $40. So they've dropped solid, you know, uh, they've dropped like 85% since then off the top of my head so that's a pretty or not not 85 percent. i'm sorry um my math was way off they've dropped like uh, they've dropped like 40 percent. my apologies guys uh but still regardless it's a big percentage 
And we'll see what happens with Rivian. 39.70s right now. Uh, we do have this low level right here, which I think is very relevant. It's right at 39, re really right at 40. And so I think 40 makes sense to pay attention to. And the reason why is because look at all these confirmations around 40, you know, 40s right here. Uh, low of the last few days. It's the low of the last three days. We tapped 39.80s back on, uh, what was that? Monday or Tuesday? Um and we popped back up to 46, dropping down to 40s now. And so I think if we're going to find some support, we have $40 whole dollar level, kind of 10 whole dollar level. And then we've got the actual low of the last few days, which is right down here at 39.77. We call it 39.75. Uh, it's crazy how consistent it dropped. It was like through $4, $3, $4, $3, $4. Right. Yeah, man. Uh, and it, like I said, I'm a little bit... Okay, I'm skeptical of EV plays that aren't Tesla long term, but I think we might be cheaped out here, depending on what you guys think. Uh, let, let's see what the chat says. Uh, what do you want to call option in? So we're shorting Rivian? No, that's not what I'm doing at all. Um, why have an earnings report when you have no earnings? Well, basically to see how much they lost. <laughs> Then um, there's also EPS, which is a gauge on how profitable the company is, whether the company makes or loses money. There's some relevant metrics to pay attention to. Um, what do y'all think about Oracle as well? Yeah, Armando. Thank you, brother. Hit that like button, guys. I'm Oracle bullish on... got beat down, close, but it's going back up now. Yeah. Let me see when. Uh, I know those earnings are going to be dropping too. Oracle had such a big swing already. Oracle numbers might be out already. Let me see. They're supposed to go live at 5 Eastern. Well, the earnings call goes live at 5. But, but the, the actual... Okay. Yeah, the numbers drop. Generally, it's like 5 to 10 minutes after close. Uh, so Oracle hasn't dropped their numbers yet, but it's coming soon in the next like 10 minutes probably. You know? We're going to be in 30 or 50? Exactly, Roman. Exactly. Uh, 30 or 50. What do you mean by that? Riv uh, Rivian's either going to drop down to 30 or go to 50 off the news. Yeah, that, that, that seems reasonable. Um, Bounce here's, Yeah. And that's actually there's... not an unreasonable amount. Like, it was down, it was $70, what, like, five, a week ago. A week right. ago, it just dropped, like, wow, I got actually beat down. Yeah. 50. 50? 50. Yeah, I mean, in Rivian. Amazon holds a lot of Rivian shares too. So like Amazon holds a lot of Rivian shares and they're going to be paying attention to it. Um, and so, you know, when Am when big money gets behind anything, you you watch it. Uh, and that's certainly true with Rivian. Still waiting. Uh, Rivian also is getting sued though. The Shaw Law Firm encourages investors in Rivian with losses of over 100K to contact the firm, the Shaw Law Firm. Um, and this happens anytime you get like a really volatile symbol that traders lose money in. In the end, though, guys, I just kind of blame it on the stock market. You know, Rivian's shooting up here, uh, up to forty-two forties. So I don't, I don't think the numbers have come out yet, but it might be a little bit early buys, a little bit telling um, of what happened. But nothing yet, not selling anything yet. But vote on the poll, guys. Bullish or bearish on Rivian? You know, right now we got Ooh, fifty-seven. Crashed hard. Did it really? Let me see. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so it did drop too. Let's see if earnings are out for either of these. Okay, so Oracle did drop numbers. So Oracle numbers just came out. That's why it's dropping. Let me let me go over the numbers here for Oracle. Uh, but yeah, they definitely dropped. Um, and so Oracle numbers, uh, third quarter adjusted EPS of a dollar and thirteen cents missed the dollar and eighteen cent estimate. Sales of ten point five one billion beat the ten point five one billion estimate. So sales are about on par with expectations. Um, Lower than expected EPS, which is earnings per share. Here's the numbers uh, for Oracle. Uh, worse than expected EPS, which is earnings per share. Uh, and what EPS is, is a gauge on how profitable the company ultimately is. And so it's telling you how profitable the company is. If it's if, if green EPS, like if they profited an EPS, then they're profitable. High EPS, profitable. Low EPS, not that profitable. Negative EPS, lose money company loses money so that's kind of how you judge these and Oracle will put in lower than expected earnings per share so worse than expected profitability but on par sales numbers here for oracle let's see if rivian has anything out for it yet 
It should be coming out pretty soon for Rivian, I'm assuming. Yeah, what ended what ended up happening with AGRI? Up to 342s. Oh wow, right. it went all the way up to 514 today. Whoa, dude. Yeah, I didn't even see that, bro. And this was one that had good fourth quarter results too. Man, that's crazy. Uh look at Rivian. I should have gotten in. Here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, honestly, a huge rip. Look at look at Rivian though, guys. I, something's got to be out for this one, unless people are just bullish in general on Rivian. Their numbers have they dropped? Have y'all seen the, the Rivian numbers anywhere else? Let me look at TOS. I'm not seeing anything out for Rivian yet. If you guys get the numbers early, let me know. We're back up to the previous closing price, and Rivian is flying up. Like I said, I was a little bit tempted to buy the dip because I thought we were just beat up so much today. Um. Yeah, somebody knows something. That's kind of what I'm thinking, ideal, um, because that's a big move, a big, big move. And like I said, Amazon has been, and you know, they have a stake in Rivian too. Um, and so, yeah, Rivian testing that previous closing price. And this is the reason, like, I want you guys to understand this level, because look at where stocks go. This thing goes directly up to that previous closing price. It's the red to green level. And so traders use it as a profit target is really why this happens. And so you can see we go right up to this light blue line, which is the previous close and traders use it. Oh no, this isn't the previous close. This is yesterday's previous close. Yeah, so that's the previous closing price from yesterday. So that is Rivian going from red today to green. Um, so traders are using it as a profit target is really what's going on here. So they are analyzing it and using it as a profit target and they're covering right when we get close to it. Um, now let's see if the numbers are out for it yet. Not seeing anything for Rivian, nothing yet. A lot of people are suing Rivian, but I don't see any numbers actually out for it yet. Scalp it one minute. Man, I don't know, dude. I could try. Big range, but not huge. Um, I'm not going to... I've made this mistake before. I'm not going to buy anything pre, pre-release. It's a fool's game, you know? Shorts are covering. Well, it's pretty good volume for pre-market, and honestly, especially pre-bell or pre-earnings. It's pretty solid volume. This especially, this 100,000 shares in pre-market is pretty high for pre, especially in a $50 stock, um, $40 stock. Hey, what's up, Chris? Watching Oracle's reaction as well. Oracle mostly reacted negatively. All right, Rivian correcting. I think 42 is important. So here's 42 right here. I'm a little bit tempted to buy this dip to 42, but I know earnings are about to drop, so I think those could influence it. Uh, Yeah, I think earnings are... Um, did numbers come out? Nothing yet. But look at the bounce right around 42. Not bad. So 60% of you are mostly bearish. So most people are bearish, it looks like, in Rivian. Um, My daughter just saved me. <laughs> What's up, Pawn? I might be crying tomorrow by not getting that $42 call. Just too much risk. Yeah, brother, listen. Stuff like that, Pawn, I wouldn't beat yourself up over. And the reason because the reason is because even if you make money in that situation, there's the risk is so high that like it's not a plus. It's not what poker players call a, a plus EV move, right? It's not going to be plus long-term expected value. Like you're not going to make money long-term. 
you know so like regardless of the individual like variance results you're not going to make money long term with that with that type of trading you know buying something pre-earnings before you really know what the earnings are and trying to basically just coin flip a, a favorable reaction is just a risky risky trading style that i don't think most people are going to make money with over the long run you know so either way i guess what i'm trying to say is don't get too upset even if it goes in your direction um yeah and so that's a good thing pawn you know that's a good move i don't know much of the company but i've heard mixed stories from investors yeah i mean i know amazon got involved and so there's some big money that is interested in it uh but i also am highly skeptical of stocks uh, specifically ev plays that aren't tesla because i think tesla what tesla did is very rare you know and i think there's kind of like a gold rush of ev companies trying to compete with tesla but what tesla did is very rare meaning for a domestic car company to succeed like tesla is incredibly rare the last one that tried to was delorean and they eventually failed as well and so betting money long term on some of these up and coming ev plays that i think are kind of in a gold rush is just a risky investment it's kind of like the space investment i talked about not liking spce years ago and the reason i didn't like it is because it's a similar thing you know the space industry is certainly not guaranteed it's certainly not a safe bet and it's just a risky play and you know space is now under under eight dollars a share and so i think in terms of long-term viability I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. It doesn't mean it's not going to succeed, but I'm just skeptical, you know, and I, I don't think anybody can fault me for that. I think it's pretty reasonable uh, to be skeptical to a certain extent. Did the MLB reach a deal, bro? Please tell me they did. I'm ready for some baseball. Good. They salvaged the full season. Good. Nice. That's great news. I didn't even see that. But that's great. Honestly, I got to find a new favorite baseball team. You know, I love the Astros, but they've just disappointed me. You know, so I got to figure out who... Uh, What's up, Max? You're back pumping CEI, bro. What does CEI do today, sir? It's down to 107. Um, listen, you know, I don't know, dude. Good luck with that, Max. You know, good luck, bro. I need a new favorite team. I'm kind of, I might go with Jacob DeGrom, but I think that's kind of everybody's riding Jacob DeGrom. Uh, I, I do like the Braves even, Braves, even though they beat the Astros. The Angels with Otani and Trout are probably like the, the most endearing team out of all the other ones so i don't know let me know what you guys like in baseball uh we had to stay over a dollar bro yeah for sure max yeah the blue jays with vladdy Are Rivi earnings out? No, I don't think so. Not yet, I don't think. We're, we're still waiting for the Rivian earnings to drop. They're supposed to drop sometime in after hours, but they're not out yet. Which, you know, I don't know if they're going to make us wait until the earnings call. Um, or what. But, but yeah. We're just kind of waiting. Rivian consolidating. Oracle did have numbers drop, and Oracle basically got beat up. Um... We'll see what happens. Max, how is CEI doing? Maybe it's a bad earnings for Rivian. McGuire says sweating. 
homeboy is long cei at 180 hitting all the chats up uh you gotta do what you gotta do yeah bro hey listen i'm not even mad at him dude as long as he's not getting too sleazy with it you know like let him do his thing i guess but the diff the problem though and i've told him before is that cei's got 300 plus million in the float it's not going to be influenced like you think it might you know it's not like going to all these chat rooms and just promoting cei heavily is really going to do anything because the float's too large man the float's too large 300 million in the float you know it's not that would be funny stuff. if we wake up tomorrow and cei is five five yeah yeah <laughs> just, like, max yeah. is like bro y'all i don't even know what's going <laughs> on bro i'm just not talking to you anymore yeah i would i would probably make a video making fun of myself if that happened i'd be like honestly i would too uh, i'd go back and find all the like skeptical comments by me and then just play them back to back and then show cei's chart and you know <laughs> just, just like the clown music or something yeah yeah exactly that's what i would do <laughs> the exact um, opposite of that first twitter video you posted right exactly everyone's like thinking, the market's the not gonna go up and you're like yes it is <laughs> um I'd curse at you guys. I mean, bro, listen, do your thing, man. Nah, come I'm on, not, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not hating on you, bro. Do your thing, man. We all like our stocks, and so if you like it, you like it, dude. You know, do your thing, man. Um, still waiting on the Rivian earnings. Nobody, nobody really. We haven't really seen the reaction from anything yet. Rivian's just sideways now. Uh, we're starting to pop up, but nothing quite yet. Checking, checking TOS, nothing. So the earnings call specifically starts in, in. 40 minutes for Rivian. But uh, TOS just dropped the news that Mizuho analyst Rakish remains bullish on Rivian despite rising nickel prices. So I'm guessing I'm, I'm guessing nickel prices are going to influence batteries. Rivian's, batteries. Yeah, right, exactly. The Rivian's profitability through battery parts uh, and the cost of building them increasing. Um so what about is, oracle it's a good oracle question. got beat up um i'm yeah. gonna be talking more about oracle and all that later on john's gonna be dipping out for a little bit so if you get anyone who wants to hang out and hear a little bit about oracle too i'm gonna be still be monitoring rivian it's the main thing but i will be looking into it yeah talking about what's going on with them what their stuff means what the new cloud computing stuff i can talk a lot more about that john knows way more about ev and the markets and all but i can talk to tech talk and all that yeah, for sure. And I have just a Oracle already dropped their numbers and Oracle's numbers. I think I have on the screen. Yeah, Oracle put in adjusted EPS, which is a gauge on how profitable they are of a dollar thirteen missed the one eighteen uh, level. Let's check out and see if they dropped any more numbers. Usually they're going to drop more than this, and I'm assuming they did. Um, yeah. So Oracle stock had EPS miss. They had dropping operating mar margins and free cash flow. Um, we did get a lot of numbers. Uh, they did declare a quarterly cash dividend of 32 cents per share of outstanding common stock to be paid to stockholders of record as of the close of business on April 8th, 2022, with a payment date of April 21st, 2022. All right. Well, that's pretty good news. I think the, I think buying this dip in Oracle makes sense. Um, and so basically if you're in oracle and you're holding oracle leading up to april 8th by april 8th on april 21st you'll receive a 32 cent per share dividend now it's not much i mean oracle um you know to put it in perspective oracle is a 72 dollar stock right so say you know you buy 100 shares of oracle it's going to be taking up 7,000 plus in buying power right and then you're going to make what 30 well, how much was the dividend 32 cents per share so yeah you're going to make 32 bucks by tying up 7,230 and so if you're holding oracle long term it's good and if you plan to hold it long term i mean it's 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 something but you know in terms of like oracle's range and and how much it moves uh the range is huge you know so it's like this is this is a dollar in price movement so it's like i don't know if it's enough to really justify buying it now that i look at it but you know i like oracle as a company and so generally i think oracle is very widely used has a lot of different uses and it's just in there when it comes to you know database and storage and servers rivian earnings are at 5 p.m yeah well the earnings call is at 5 p.m but the earnings call is at 5 p.m but the earnings are supposed to drop before then after market close 
But I understand why Rivian might not want that. Because, you know. I don't think anybody is expecting Rivian to put in any type of profit at all. Um, it would be kind of crazy if they did. And I think they would go absolutely crazy in terms of like upward movement. But like, I don't know how Oracle or I don't know how Rivian is going to be making money when they're not selling cars yet. Um, all right. So they also said Rivian Automotive sent out emails telling reservation holders to expect deliveries of their R1T electric pickup trucks and R1S electric SUVs starting in March. And so we'll see if they're still on par with those expectations during the earnings call. I think that's when it's gonna, really going to be relevant is what they update us on in the earnings call for Rivian. Um, and so I think there's like a list of people that have bought them and that it's kind of sitting on the list, kind of like what Tesla did with the Cybertruck, I think. Uh, March 2024. Is that really what it is? Or are you just saying that? Let me see. It didn't specify that. Let me look this up. This is from a while ago. This, this article was done about four months ago, though, five months ago. March to April, April to May and May to June. So I'm assuming they're talking about 2022. But again, we'll know, we'll learn more during the earnings call for Rivian, really. Okay, you're okay, you're busting both. Okay, got you. I was gonna say, man, 20. I honestly I I wouldn't put it past them either, though. That's why I was just being sure. I'm not promoting it's got potential. Yeah, I mean. Where do you find where do you uh, where do you see Rivian's potential at? What does Rivian do differently than everybody else? What kind of company are they? Explain it, Max. Let's hear it. I'm down to hear it, you know. Um, convince me on why you like CEI, and I'll listen. Honestly, I'm it, usually this is the first earnings call that I've had. Look at Amazon, Roman says. Their huge beat was Rivian. What do you what do you mean their huge beat was? Amazon made a bunch of their money from uh, from insider holdings that were inside the company from uh, buying Rivian. Mm. You know, whenever Rivian Rivian actually went crazy when it first IPO'd, it ripped all the way up to like one hundred and eighty dollars, and I think Amazon capitalized on it. Uh, is what I think it is. So a lot of their a lot of Amazon's earnings beat from a while back was from holding Rivian stock. Um, I don't know how long that would have actually held though, but like that's what it was. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking to play. I think Tesla's just ahead of these companies, man. I think they're just doing it better, man. And like they, I just think they're doing it better. Um, I feel like that's partly on just like Elon. He's kind of right. just, you know, he's willing to sacrifice a little bit of profits and all that for short term gains. They know that people are going to buy Tesla regardless. They know they're going to make some profits. And Elon's like, I got a bunch of other cool stuff that I'm doing. I still got stocks. I got whatever. Whereas a lot of our companies like Ford that wants to get into electric vehicles, right? They're still able to. It just they got their whole design process plus a million other things they're already focused on with that. Right. And it's also like the pop culture influence makes makes Tesla cool. Like the pop culture and like Elon being cool and being relevant to young people makes Tesla cool and relevant to young people right? Uh, buying a Tesla is like a flex. You know, you're, you're flexing on people by buying a Tesla because Tesla is cool because Elon is cool, right? Ford, I'm not saying Ford's not cool, Ford, but Ford is cool to a much more niche audience. You know, it's much more subjective where it's like Tesla's different, but they have that influence of Elon and that helps it gain like pop culture relevancy, you know? So it's like people are buying Tesla's because they know Elon and, you know, it's just kind of this big thing where Tesla is incredibly popular for people in the U.S. now. Where Ford has been around for a while, that popularity is just not quite at the same areas. It's hard to explain if that makes sense. But
NIO actually has a product, but the U.S. announced China audits today for NIO. Yeah, I've seen NIO grow from being like a really cheap stock of like two or three bucks all the way up to over, you know, $15 where it's at now. It's kind of corrected a lot, though, over the last few, you know, few months, as has a lot of things. You know, NIO was at 40, 50 bucks back in November, December. It's now at $17. So are you buying the NIO dip? Uh, that's a bet on EV, too. But it's just interesting because I've seen NIO go from like one or two dollars all the way up to over 40, 50, you know. DocuSign is getting smacked. Uh, let me see. Docu, I haven't even looked at it. My, I don't know. I don't know, Dustin. The only, the only reason I don't like convertibles is you just get so hot. Yeah, dude. I don't like convertibles. They're uncomfortable, bro. They're just not comfortable, man. You know, <laughs> and they're scary to drive in. Like, yeah. it, they're really scary to drive in, unless you got someone who's got a roll bar and all that stuff. Like, right. It takes a very specific, like, niche thing to enjoy a convertible. Like, if I'm driving around like my little town and I'm not getting on the interstate and it's beautiful scen scenery where I live, yeah, maybe I'll drive a convertible. But if I'm about to drive on the interstate, I'm not trying to just not hear anything and just have the wind <laughs> smacking me in my face. 80 miles an hour. Yeah, like nobody wants to experience that. But if, like I said, if I'm driving around town going 30 miles an hour, sure. It looks like Rivian just dropped their numbers. Uh, I'm seeing a huge drop on Rivian right now. So this is almost uh, for sure Rivian numbers coming out. Let me see. Maybe not. I'm not seeing anything yet, but this is a big reaction candle. So volume ticked up. Uh, let's see if we can figure out. Still not seeing anything yet. So if you guys see anything, let me know. Yeah, a lot of people saying Rivian forgot to report. Maybe they are taking a nap. This has got to be Rivian being out, though. Um, you know, this is either Rivian being out or Amazon. <laughs> uh, potentially getting rid of some shares. We'll see. You know, we'll see. Yeah, look at this drop. Rivian tanking, guys, down to $40 a share. Still waiting for the numbers to come out. Yeah, Rivian just dumping down. Huge drop. Are you buying the Rivian dip? Let me know. It looks like the chat was right. 62% of you were right. Rivian bears. I'm still surprised the numbers haven't actually come out. Like, this is kind of... It's just it's just different. You never see this happen. Generally, they're going to drop earnings right after the bell. Like, at like 405, 450. Rivian just ripped up to 43. Whoa, dude. And it's even weirder because there's nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> like, nothing dropped. There's no fundamental catalyst for these huge $3.50 candle wicks right now, man. Um, it's These are huge. These are huge wicks. This is like this is like a dollar fifty or This is like three fifty per share. $3.50 per share candle wicks. And no explanation for them. So somebody either unloading some size. Look at all that volume, too. This is 170,000 shares that just went through on that candle. Um... Does anybody know what the heck is going on with Rivian right now, though? How much money is that? 170,000 times? Yeah, um, I got a calculator. Yeah, I got you. Uh, it's roughly $7,000. Or no, it's roughly... Oh, wait. Sorry. It's, I think it's 680,000. Um, 40 times 170,000. Oh, it's 6.8 million. My math was off by one digit. Uh, $6.8 million. Wild, yeah. So that's six point eight million in, in price action right there. But again, it's it's super strange because this is just insider numbers. Okay, here they go. They finally dropped their numbers. So somebody, maybe that's Bloomberg Terminal over there <laughs> dropping numbers early. Uh, all right, I'm looking this up now, but the numbers are out. Uh, I did we did finally get confirmation that the numbers are out. Um, Waiting for them to actually report it here. Uh, Rivian.com slash investors. Uh, fourth quarter. Oracle just yeeted up to back to 77 and then right. immediately back down. Yeah. So here's the numbers. Three vehicles were launched in the U.S. The R1T, the R1S, and EDV. 2,425 vehicles were produced as of March 8th, 2022. So as of two days ago, they have 11.5 thousand employees. I'm looking for the actual numbers. Uh, they should be dropping now. 
Let's see if Benzing is a little bit faster. Basically, we gotta wait for somebody to organize all these numbers. So I've got the PowerPoint set up. But they kind of hide it here. Okay, got that. Is nobody reporting this? What happened? Um, people are saying these are bots faking everything. All right, so Rivian put in, I gotta try to find these, adjusted net loss, here we go. I found it. Uh, Rivian put in adjusted net loss per share, non GAAP, uh, of, for 2021, total of minus 1478 per share. Um, that's pretty big. Adjusted EBITDA, non GAAP, of, 2,790. We'll have to see what that number actually is. But I think we're going to drop for Rivian some more. Okay, here we go. They put in fourth quarter loss per share $4.83 in the fourth quarter. Finally, um, fourth quarter loss per share of $4.83. And I'll put this up in the, uh, for us to see it. And here's the drop. I think 483 was the number. Let me make sure. Yeah, fourth quarter adjusted loss per share of two of four dollars and eighty three cents. Um, we're we're dropping some more numbers here, so just bear with me. Yep, the Rivian dropping. All right, so yeah, Rivian put in fourth quarter EPS of $2.43 loss, missed the $1.97 loss estimate, sales of $54 million, missed the $60.03 million estimate. And so obviously worse than expected. Uh, that was the big number. We knew they were going to lose money because, frankly, they haven't sold any cars yet. Uh, they haven't even you know sold one car yet, I don't think. But the judge was, of that was how much they missed or how much they lost relative to expectations. And the expectations were for fourth quarter EPS of a dollar and 97 cent loss. But they put in at two dollar and 43 cent loss per share. So really, this is roughly 23 uh, percent higher in losses than they expected. If my math is right, just off the top of my head from 197 to 243, that looks like it's about like 23%, something like that. Um, and so it was a little bit higher than expected. And Rivian is dropping down. It's at 3926, 39.26. Um, I like Rivian. I hope they succeed right now. I'm just a bear. Yeah, I feel you, bro. Um, Rivian put in fourth quarter adjusted EBITDA loss of 1.1 billion versus adjusted EBITDA loss of 341 million in the same quarter last year. So way higher than expected, uh, way higher than last time loss. So we'll put this number up as well. Pretty big numbers, uh, pretty big loss per share. Let me see. You can see the numbers scrolling at the bottom of the screen if you want to see what's going on here. And look at this tank. Glad I didn't buy it, bro. I almost bought it in, in pre-bell. I almost bought it in pre-bell. Um, Rivian has produced 2,425 vehicles since the start of production. But you can see the numbers, full numbers. Man, look at this drop down to $38 a share. My monitor was upside down, bro. Right. <laughs> Let 
but Rivian's tanking. Is this the second time we've heard this song? Or is this song just really, really, really long? Okay, it's five minutes long. Five, six minutes long. All right, so Pawn, I'm, I'm sure you're happy you didn't buy this, right? Man. I owe my daughter a big ol' ice cream for sure now. Dude, you, yeah, for sure. She was right, man. Rivian dumping down here. Oracle consolidating pretty pretty slowly still. The earnings call for Rivian is going to be at, in 23 minutes. It won't reverse tomorrow unless people are blind. Yeah, man, it's it's a tough one, dude. It's really tough to tell. You know, at what point do you consider Rivian extended on the downside, I think is the question. And so at what point do you think Rivian is extended on the downside? Happy I got puts. Hey, yeah, puts are paying right now, bro. Um, looks like the chat was right on their votes. Are you a Rivian fourth quarter earnings? Wait for a pullback and stock split news. My buddy bought it at 70. I told him to cut at 60. He's still in. Ooh, that's rough, Roman. Sorry to hear that, brother. Jim Cramer got it right. He said, don't buy Rivian. Honestly, dude, it would be it would be hard to convince me to buy Rivian long term. Because again, the logic is like, okay, Tesla is Tesla. Rivian is not Tesla. And Rivian hasn't even started producing vehicles yet. So, you know, back 30, 40 years ago, Rivian wouldn't even be a public company if they're not profitable. You know, this started with Netscape back in, you know, uh, the late 90s, where Netscape had the most successful IPO in history for a company that technically wasn't profitable yet. And I think my, it might be the most successful IPO in history. And ever since then, we've been IPOing companies that aren't technically profitable, like Rivian. And so 40 years ago, Rivian wouldn't even be listed publicly, you know. And so it's one of those things where I think in order to get more money flowing through their company, they go public early before they're actually profitable. But it causes these companies that just have these huge swings and a lot of a lot of optimism and pessimism just kind of flowing because it's such a gamble to bet on it. <clears throat> What price is a good buy? Sheesh, man, I don't know, dude. I mean, just in terms of like psychological uh, extension, I don't. Th I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a little bit tempted to buy, but at this point in time, who knows where this thing's gonna drop? You know, or stop dropping? You know, I think we're pretty extended on the downside now, but like, that's always a gamble. Anyone buying the dip? I don't know. Let us know, guys. You buying the dip of this? A good buy under 25, in my opinion. Yeah. I could see that. We're going to definitely I'll see buy... some recovery on Rivian under 25. Yeah, for sure. I kind of like this stance, which is I'll buy Rivian when I see some on the road. I get it. They're supposed to be dropping them this month. I don't know if they're still planning on doing that. Bro, the sun is right in my eyes. I need to get like another blind here. <laughs> How do you think this will affect Oh, yeah. No, that's right on you. Yeah, dude. Like, it's like right here. <laughs> uh, do you have anything you could put over it? See, I, it's if y'all can see this, I have like a box up there. No, it's literally like if you see your camera, it's covering your face is like glowing white, like right. angelic glowing white. Yeah, I look like Edward in Twilight, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get like a hat because I need it. Uh, Lucid is going to, uh, yeah, here's a good question. I see somebody question. How do you think this is going to affect Lucid, LCID, and really other EVs? Like, will this affect Tesla? Is this good or bad, bad for Tesla? Tesla hasn't really reacted to it. But Lucid, LCID is going down with it in sympathy. Um, NIO is, isn't is really reacting to it. So Lucid is, but you know all the other ones haven't necessarily reacted to this yet. You bought 200 at 3680? I hope you're right. Yeah. Hey, good luck, bro. That's cheap. I mean, I, I think that's, I don't. Are you going long on it? 
Because if you look at the forecast, a one-year forecast is Rivian to 120. But obviously, yeah. that's that's a forecast. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't hate it. I don't hate that dip. But it, it, it's obviously risky, too. You know, but like to me, it seems a little extended where it is now. But that's just for my short term trading bias, I think. Um, I'll be right back, guys. Uh, give me like 30 seconds. Bobby, hold it down. I'll be right back. Yeah, Andrew, actually, uh, in the earnings call, I believe, what did they say? Rivian's car is supposed to be going down or up in price about $2,000 per because of the nickel cost. Definitely could explain. You don't think it's found a bottom yet? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I could go either way. I think. Uh, yeah, I was good. I said it. I was muted. I think. But Oracle is going up now. Oracle's back up to seventy three dollars. What? The, what is the EPS? Anybody know? Yeah, look at the bottom of the screen. Um, EPS for they put in fourth quarter EPS of two dollar and forty three cent loss per share. Uh, missed the one dollar and ninety seven cent loss. Oh, twenty percent, not two k. That's huge. Wait, what? Uh, point, so someone was, I believe, responded to my nickel, to what I said. Uh, Rivian's supposed to be increasing their price by 2K because of the nickel increase. AANNKK says 20%, not 2K. Oh, so, so did I read that wrong? Can, is anyone there able to confirm that for me? I don't have the numbers up. Yeah, I mean, that kind of makes sense with the price of nickel going up as much as it did, that they're going to have to increase prices. Um, 20% 20, 20 seems excessive but it it's certainly in turn like it's it's possible 20 um, percent sure. is what they said yeah so like right. if they're if they're if their cars are 100k they're gonna go up by 20k so that's that's a lot you know that's a lot Ripping yeah in the yeah uh rivian already announced 15k more per vehicle hmm yeah, and the earnings call for Rivian, let me sign up. So just to show you, Bobby, how you do this, and for anybody else at home too, uh, if you want to catch the Rivian earnings call, what you do is you just type in Rivian earnings call in mm -hmm. Google, and it'll bring you to investor relations for Rivian. That's where you get on these earnings calls. And you click oh, yeah. that and, uh, yeah, you just go to investor relations, you scroll down, you'll see something on the right side. If you scroll down, you'll see fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings webcast, and it is scheduled to start. You got to put your name and stuff in there. Uh, and then uh, I got some wait screen. It's supposed to start at 4 p.m., so in 15 minutes. But there's Rivian low of the day break. So Rivian's starting to break lows. Bear trap, Angel. Nickel futures went up 100%. Uh, that 20% price increase was before the recent nickel price hike. Y'all, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We do this live for free every single day right here. We don't sell a course. We don't sell a service. We don't claim to be experts. We don't charge for anything. And we just give everything away for free. We hold these earnings calls. And so show support for what we're doing. Hit the subscribe button. It's the least you can do, guys. Thank you guys for helping me hit 78,000 subscribers. So I really appreciate you guys. Uh, If it's short term, useless, but if it lasts, yikes for EV manufacturers who don't have nickel contracts. Yeah. And y'all can hear the music, correct? Mm hmm. 
I subbed. Don't spam my videos. What? What? <laughs> He's probably a small time like console or content creator for like gaming or something. Yeah. Yeah, dude, trust me, I'm not, dude. I'm not gonna spam your videos. Please don't spam mine. You know, it's really what it is. Um, That's the funniest part people don't realize is that most of the time, even if you dislike stuff, well, before dislikes used to mean something a lot of times, but now like dislikes, commenting negative stuff, all of it's just engagement. All you do is help that person. Yeah, exactly. It's all engagement. That's why I said like uh, we have these people that I'm kind of happy that it, that they changed the rules. We used to have these people that would just wait in like every single one of my live streams. They would just dislike, it. and it was just kind of like, dude, like, what are y'all doing with y'all's life? If y'all are over, you here, got nothing like, better to do, yeah, right? Like, what are y'all doing, man? Y'all ain't got nothing better to do than just sit around and be like, I hate John because he said something mean to me, you know, a year and a half ago. So now I'm just going to camp out and wait for him to drop something and spend all my time disliking the videos. It's just weird, you know. But eventually they got rid of it. So, I mean, I guess it's, I don't know. I'm torn on it. I'm torn on whether we should have gotten rid of it. Um, here comes 35. Yeah, 35 here. 36 now. I don't know, man. I don't Angel know how much. calls he... a falling knife opportunity. Yeah. I mean, All you got to do is catch the handle, brother. That's all you got to do. Yeah. I mean, I'm torn on whether I think it's a good idea, you know. Um, I thought it was a good idea about a dollar and a half ago. And so at this point in time, I was just wrong. And I don't, I, it's one of the reasons I'm just not buying. I don't know. I don't like Rivian enough long term. And usually when I buy these dips, I like buying them in companies that I think have great chances of success long term, you know. So it's like, even if it doesn't work out, I'm still okay, you know. That's awesome that you found us though that way, McGuire. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, man. Um, Hey, yeah. Uh, uh, hold on one second, Bobby. I'll be right back. Yeah, of course. Cool. Oracle's got some good outlook though for the next year. They got some good DOD contracts. They like I said, they got into Red Bull stuff. They got Cloud Word, Cloud World coming out and all that. So I think they plan to announce some stuff that hasn't really been talked about before. Cloud computing's really gonna be taking a huge, huge turn too. Pretty upsweep. Almost at 35. 4's a better buy. America all the way, Joe. You see it, Rivian under 30? Yeah, that's what someone else called out at the start. They said either to 30 or to 50, and that's pretty much what we saw. It got beat down earlier today, and then it just held that level, and then based off earnings, you know, it's already been in a downtrend, so all it needed was bad news to keep it going. Someone, someone was in what? Someone was in short at, like, I have no idea, like, what, $40, they said? You're, you're happy right now. I know that. <laughs> We're being going to 130 in a year. That's what they're forecasted. But if this nickel prices thing keeps holding and some other stuff. Did Oracle beat earnings? I don't believe their earnings are out yet. All right, guys, I'm back. Um, oh, they are. I lied. Cash burn going to continue for multiple years. Hope they make it through, but I'm not touching the stock. Tesla is a safer bet with lots of upside if they hit their energy and vehicle targets. Yeah, exactly. I, I think Tesla is just relevant culturally. Um, Rivian is not, and that's going to be a huge difference between Tesla and Rivian. Uh, Tanvir, I don't know if you talked about Oracle earnings, Bobby, but... Oracle put in mixed results, on par sales numbers lower than expected EPS, I think, is what Oracle, Oracle numbers were. Uh, yeah, lower than expected EPS. They missed it by five cents per share. So they, they put in 113 per share, fourth, uh, third quarter adjusted EPS. The expectation was for 118. So they missed it by five cents. Uh, sales put in 10.51, which is on par with the 10.51 billion estimate. So that's kind of what happened to Oracle. 
The cool part, though, is a lot of these cloud companies and whatnot really aren't going to be affected by the same factors as everything else. At the end of the day, everyone needs servers and cloud computing and you know IT administration, no matter what. Right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, Oracle, I think, will be fine long term, too, regardless of anything else. Um, Oracle's been in a pretty big downtrend for like two months now. A little. Yeah. Yeah. It, it at, at a certain point, it's going to start being extended. I think the whole market is dropping with it. Man, Rivian's still dropping down, guys. There's 35. Um, but I think if we look at like the spy over uh, and you zoom out on the spy and you zoom out on Oracle, I think it's a large enough company to where it's trending with the market basically mm -hmm. if you look if you pull up the spy daily chart and you pull up oracle's daily chart i think it's just very very similar and so i think betting on oracle now is kind of like betting on the spy you know if spy goes up oracle will probably go up if the spy goes down oracle will probably go down long term you know that's what uh, i was might. gonna say is that like uh, well uh, long term wise i think oracle is definitely going to be going up just because they're, they're established they've been like i say really really look to things like red bull and stuff like that because that's what a lot of these other bigger companies are going to be doing right right they're going to be looking to say you know if your stuff's working in high speed race environments how's it going to work we're you know millimeters or less than that fractions of a second matter how's that going to work in a doctor's environment with microscopic surgeries how's right. that going to work under seas with you know autonomous vehicles or how's that going to work with my autonomous drone networks and stuff there's a lot of room for where this stuff's going to be heading with Oracle. Right. And they've already been announced to like DOD uh, publicly congratulated how good they've been doing. Red Bull publicly congratulated them for how good they've been doing. You know, and nice. I think a lot of people are just, are, Oracle's kind of been really in a back burner because they themselves acknowledged they've been like, with Java 7 and all that. It was kind of, it was as a programmer, it was slacking. Like when you really look at like where programming's headed and everything. Yeah. It was really, really slacking. A lot of people weren't turning to it. Heck, Kotlin and all that came out because they're really like, 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 fine, if you don't want to fix it, Oracle. No, Oracle, I think, made even made Kotlin. I don't know who made Kotlin. I think Oracle did because they're like, we're just whatever. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. What, which which area is back in programming headed to? Um, is it moving away from Java and for like mobile development? Or I, I know, I know Swift is out. Um, and I know re I know native languages. everything's trying to build in with web really okay. that's where it's yeah. heading Java's already there Kotlin's already there Django's already there um, the biggest thing is like integrating like, like you see let's take github for instance you can open your github app you can open your github desktop you can open up github web browser you can open up, up you know and then the github website and all of that right yeah for sure and it's really annoying because like let's let's say go fast forward or go back 10 years right php for your website java mm -hmm. or swift for your phone then right. you got c plus plus or c for your desktop and then you got php or python or whatever the heck as your actual back end right and then mysql right. and all this stuff like that's that's part of the beauty of django right you don't even have to know mysql unless you really want to start doing stuff like really, yeah. really, really complex. Needed. Exactly. Like yeah. that most people would never dream of. So. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. You know. But that's long story wraparound. Oracle really has been put on the back burner, but now I, I just feel like I've been seeing them pop up more. They've been promoting themselves and ads more. I've been getting a lot more mm -hmm. I've seen them in places like that in recent right. years. So just keep your eye on them. They, you know, I don't know. They seem like they're up to some stuff. Right. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. They're just a huge company, man. In the programming world, you know. Uh, and I think they'll always be around. It's just about whether they can hold these levels, you know. All right, guys. The conference call is starting in four minutes. Yeah, we're going to listen to the call A, so it will be here. Um Oh, I don't know. We can listen to the Oracle call or we can listen to, you know, I think I titled it the Rivian call. So I think most people are waiting for the Rivian call. Um, now, we could always do a poll to see which one you guys would prefer. Um, I know Bobby's going to hold it down for me during the call, whichever one it is. Um, should I do a poll, Bobby? What do you think, man? 
Yeah, might as okay. well run the poll. <clears throat> yeah. So Andrew's asking for the Rivian call. Well, yeah, we're just going to vote on the poll and we'll do whichever one wins. So uh, I think most people are waiting for the Rivian call. Though. Yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm not even going to pull that. Every okay. single person unanimously was like Rivian. Rivian yeah, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so the poll, the call starts in three minutes. Um, do you know how to pull it up, Bobby? Yeah, I'm getting it right now. Okay. Um, it's pretty easy. Just make sure to mute the... Uh, I'm going to mute your screen real quick while you pull it up. Just let me know once it's up. The biggest thing is that you mute the hold music. The hold music's fine. I didn't monetize yep. the stream. Um, yeah, so I didn't monetize this stream. But like one of the... I think it was on like the Amazon conference or uh, earnings call. They gave me a copyright notification now it wasn't a strike it was just somebody saying hey if you monetize that stream we get money from it because of the hold music um and honestly i don't even know if it would hold i, I could probably dispute it but like just in case mm -hmm. i'm just not gonna i'm not gonna monetize the stream so that we don't ever have to worry about that but also if you can just mute the hold music mm -hmm. and just wait until like four minutes and 30 seconds i'll tell you when it's actually up um, i'm still on hold with them now all right i got it muted for there yeah, it's still playing. Um, cool. But yeah, the, the earnings call will start in like two minutes, I think. How did Blink do? We can take a look at Blink, B-L-N-K. Blink did bad. Uh, Blink charging stations, uh, EV play as well. Um, so it might be getting affected by Rivian, but it also, I think, had bad earnings too. Calls are like peanut click characters. Well, calls are basically just pumping up the stock in question, you know? Uh, they are, they pre-screen the questions so that you can't really ask them any hard questions. Um, they, they vet it to where, you know, they're telling you only positive things and they're, they're telling you negative things too, but they're sugarcoating it and nonsense, you know? <laughs> um, it's really easy to twist how something sounds regardless of the actual numbers, uh, by just using optimistic tones you know what i mean in, in a lot of different ways so that's kind of what most earnings calls are but they're still interesting to listen to and kind of hear like if you like these companies long term you probably should be listening to them just to kind of get a gauge on profitability expectations um, guidance stuff like that What do you think of Rivian's impact on the EV market impact GGPI? Um, I think it really is going to depend on what the outcome of their production looks like. I think the production is going to be the most relevant part and, and to see how they can do so. Um, to see how they can pull off production, if they can pull off production successfully and actually, you know, s start swinging towards profitability. Obviously that's going to dictate their impact on the entire EV community. Um, you know, I think Rivian between second runner up in terms of like who has the most market dominance in the EV space is probably either it's probably Rivian. Rivian's probably number two. Um, but you know, there's also Lucid, there's NIO, there's a lot of these other EV companies that are not as big, but you know, I, I don't think it really matters that much now. I think it, it matters on what their end product is and like how, efficient their end product is relative to price um all right so we got it up let me make sure this is running hold on okay yeah it's live bobby or no it's not live yet it's still it's still waiting um mm -hmm. my screen share is live with everything on there okay cool yeah, I know you got a... Don't you have a appointment right now? So my, my appointment's at 410, I just checked. Uh, but it, it's up to you. If you want to hold it down, you know, you can. Uh, might be good kind of experience anyway. So, you know. Uh, but yeah, just let me know if you're ready. As long as you can... Just some tips. Once you start the conference call, just check with everybody. Make sure... Vice President okay, of it, All right, yeah, it's started. So the Rivian's call has started. So if you could pull it up, Bobby. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure the stream can hear it. And then I'm going to bow out. Appreciate everybody joining the call. The only thing is the music. I don't know how to. Yeah, you don't need the music uh, here. I'm going to exit out of that anyway, just because here I'll put your screen up. 
Oh, I can just put non copyright on my own stuff. That's right. Yeah, well, just don't. Uh, even it's an earnings call, so you don't want to play music anyway, really. Um, Got it. Wait, are you playing the music now? Are you playing no, the earnings call? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just turn the volume all the way up and just start it. You know. Wait. Uh, I can't hear it, so you might want to stop screen and reshare. Yeah. Yep. Uh, all good. They don't say anything important yet, so you're all good. We're starting the earnings call right now, guys. Um, and I can put it up for mine while we wait. I guess. Uh, there we go. Okay. So let me know once you get it up. I got uh, it. A shareholder it. letter, both of which can be found right, on guys. the website at Rivian. Yeah, I can hear it. Com forward slash investors. During this call, we will discuss both gap. All right, Bobby, I'm out. Financial measures. Thanks, brother. I'll see you guys the later. Of gap to non-gap financial measures is provided in today's shareholder letter. With that, I'll turn the call over to RJ, who will begin with a few opening remarks. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our earnings call. Before we dive in, we wanted to first take a moment to address the crisis in Ukraine. As an organization, we are deeply concerned about Russia's invasion and stand by the people of, of Ukraine. It should be up, Playmaker. The humanitarian crisis resulting from the current development is clearly becoming... Can you guys hear it right now? ...governments and companies around the world. We are inspired by the actions so many have taken and will continue to evaluate ways we at Rivian can show our support. As Tim mentioned just before the call, we published our shareholder letter, which includes an overview of the progress we've made over the recent months. I'd encourage you to read it for additional details around some of the items we'll cover on today's call. We'll touch on our recent achievements, Low. production All progress, good. Cool. and product development. Before we do that, I want to personally address last week's pricing announcement. Released, we released an update to our R1 product portfolio that included our new dual motor propulsion system, as well as our standard battery pack. The dual motor propulsion system consists of a single motor drive axle, where we've integrated the drive unit, the inverter, the gearbox into a really power dense package. And in the dual motor application, we put one of those in the front and one of those in the rear of the vehicle. And in total, it delivers over 600 horsepower and achieves zero to 60 in less than four seconds. It's really cool. Uh, we also use that drive unit in a single motor application as a front drive unit in our commercial delivery vans. Along with that, our standard battery pack is leveraging LFP and LFP chemistry and that chemistry not only allows us to offer that pack at a lower cost, but it really fits commercial applications well. And it's first going to be launched in the commercial vehicle platform later this year, and then we'll make its way into our consumer vehicles uh, by late 2023. Uh, now, as we develop these new offerings, uh, we need to make sure that these offerings could fit into our product portfolio. And to do that, we revisited the overall pricing strategy. Prior to the pricing changes, our R1 platform had a price range without options of 67,500 to 83,500 and only included quad motor variants. With the addition of these new product offerings, the, R1's, the R1 platform's price range is now 67,500 to 95,000, including both quad and dual motor configurations, as well as the standard range uh, LFP battery pack. On March 1st, we announced the dual motor and standard battery pack along with this updated pricing model. In applying the updated pricing to existing pre-order customers, we failed to appreciate that customers viewed their configuration as price locked, and we wrongly assumed pre-order customers would be open to reconfiguring to the recently announced dual motor and standard battery pack if they wanted to maintain a similar price point to the original configuration. We recognized this was a mistake and quickly moved to honor the original configured pricing for our pre-March 1st pre-orders. Our relationship with customers is the most important aspect of what we're building, and we believe our early customers are critical for establishing the brand foundation needed to support many millions of sales across our future vehicle portfolio. Since launching in 2018, we believe the brand loyalty we have forged is one of our most valuable assets and something we believe will continue to drive network effects moving forward. With this, we remain highly confident in our ability to address the massive market opportunity that sits before us. Electrification is at a tipping point, as trillions of miles traveled each year across the planet transition to EVs. This is a massive shift and one that requires multiple companies to be successful in building interesting products that give customers lots of choices. While the near-term <clears throat> industry conditions remain very fluid, our path to creating long-term value is unchanged. 
we are targeting the most attractive market segments with exceptional products. In the consumer space, we're building a global brand that applies to a wide range of product sizes and markets in the truck, SUV, and crossover segments. In the commercial space, we're targeting with an initial, we're launching with an initial focus on last mile delivery through our partnership with Amazon, and we'll use this critical scale to support growth across the commercial space. We are in a unique position to establish significant last mile market share through our Amazon partnership and have the opportunity to capitalize on software and services through Fleet OF. We are vertically integrating core technologies to ensure our products continue to lead, enable us to move quickly to make enhancements, and provide long-term structural cost advantages. The initial feedback from customers and third parties has been really rewarding to see. From customers excited about the most recent OTA, to Motor Trend selecting our R1T as their 2022 truck of the year, our products continue to generate a lot of enthusiasm. All this excitement continues to, to provide momentum to the brand. As of March 8th, we had approximately 83,000 pre-orders. Our pricing model, which encompasses the dual motor drivetrain and standard pack has demonstrated continued strong demand with pre-orders following the pricing update remaining at approximately the same rate as prior to the announcement. Demand remains extremely robust. With our 2022 priorities, we've been very focused on ensuring we have the right team working towards our mission. Next week, we'll be announcing our new COO that'll be responsible for helping to scale our production and supply chain. We've also continued to hire great leadership across the business to keep up with our rapid scaling. Ultimately, the strength of our team is what determines our ability to execute our vision. Not surprisingly, our highest priority for the remainder of 2022 is ramping production of our normal Illinois manufacturing facility. As of March 8th, we'd produced 1,410 vehicles this quarter and 2,425 vehicles since the start of production late last year. During the last two weeks, we've averaged a weekly production rate that is approximately two times the exit rate of the fourth quarter of 2021. With that, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, the R1 production ramp. This ramp's progressing well across all areas of the R1 production line, and we're achieving demonstrated production rates that are in line with our expectations. And with all this progress, the, the biggest constraints we now face really lie with the supply chain. And it's really a small number of parts for which the supplier isn't ramping at the same rate as our production lines are ramping up. Uh, I wanna talk just about one specific area. Previously, we talked about battery modules, we, and this was a constraint that we saw at various times through Q4. And as you may remember, we have two module lines, module line one, module line two. And module line one is now running at twice the speed at what we saw at the end of 2021. And module line two is ramping up very quickly uh, and in line with our expectations. With line one and line two now ramping, battery modules are no longer a constraint for the plant. With that, I also want to talk about R1S. And R1S is being ramped very methodically. We learned a lot from what we went through in the fourth quarter. And as we're methodically ramping this up, we're balancing component supply for the parts that are different on R1S relative to R1T. And we're also managing the fact that that product is coming up behind the R1T in terms of its level of, of ramp maturity to make sure that we're optimizing for overall production output for the line. Now, with that said, we should also talk about EDV. And the EDV ramp is quite a bit different than what we've been through on R1. It benefits from all the learnings you'd expect from the EDV line really being our second production line. Operationally, the line is ramping as intended without any major surprises or roadblocks. But as we've seen with R1, we are gated by a number of supplier ramp challenges. And given that the EDV production lines are capable of ramping faster than what we saw with R1, these supply constraints feel more pronounced than what we experienced in the initial weeks of ramping R1. With these supply constraints, the EDVs being built are being used to refine the digital integration of our software systems with Amazon to ensure alignment with the standard, standard operating procedures for these vehicles. Feedback from Amazon and the drivers on the software is quickly being ingested and we're using that to drive the OTAs on the platform. With all this, we expect EDV production to ramp considerably during Q2. Now, it's worth noting the challenges our suppliers are facing vary and include company-specific production issues, COVID-related delays, and semiconductor allocations. 
or working closely with any of these constrained suppliers to identify component challenges early so that it can support the, the supplier ramp and develop alternative solutions if needed. While the 2022 production ramp is a core focus from an operational point of view, our future technology and product pipeline are also really exciting. Uh, as a preview of some of the major initiatives, <clears throat> we're developing a proprietary 800 volt architecture, which includes new in-house drive units that will further enhance performance and efficiency of our announced dual and quad motor configuration. This higher voltage architecture also includes onboard charger, DC to DC converter, and DC to AC converter, where the power stages of the DC AC and the AC DC are bidirectional and share semiconductors, magnetics, and the controller. Uh, we're also developing a heat pump based thermal system, and along with that, a range of new battery packs, including what I talked about before the LFP chemistry, uh, an LFP chemistry being used within these packs. Now, beyond the in vehicle power electronics, we also continue to develop our portfolio of charging and energy products. Uh, Oracle really absolutely ripping right now, we've guys. We've talked about and shown in our DC chargers to include a bi directional home charger and home energy products. And the technology work isn't just focused on propulsion platforms or charging or power electronics. We're also developing an improved network architecture and the associated electronics topology to consolidate multiple compute platforms for reduced cost and complexity. We're developing our next generation of perception hardware along with that, and that perception hardware is being used with a new uh, higher compute uh, platform for the autonomous system. We believe that all these investments and all this technology will really increase the, the desirability and, and of course the capability of our vehicles. Uh, while also delivering improved unit economics on the vehicles. Next, let me pass the call along to Claire, who will provide an update on our financials and the business outlook. Thanks, RJ. I want to echo RJ's feeling of encouragement with the progress we're making at the plant, the robust technology roadmap we have in place, and the strong backlog of demand from consumers in Amazon. I'll start with a review of our fourth quarter 2021 results. After years of development and design, 2021 was an important year for Rivian as we launched three vehicles across two vehicle platforms and initiated our first customer deliveries. During the fourth quarter, we produced 1,003 vehicles and delivered 909 vehicles, which generated $54 million of revenue. As we've discussed in the past, as we ramp our production, the volumes being produced on our manufacturing lines are a small fraction of our current 150,000 units of annual capacity. In the near term, we expect this dynamic of high fixed costs associated with operating and running our large scale, highly vertically integrated plant amortized over a small but growing number of vehicles produced across the R1 and RCV platforms will continue to have a negative drag on gross profit. In addition, we experienced higher costs due to inflation and supply chain challenges, which resulted in increased bill of materials and higher logistics costs associated with expediting shipping of certain parts. As a result, in the fourth quarter, we generated a negative gross profit of $383 million. Additionally, we recorded a lower of cost or net realizable value LCNRV adjustment to write down the value of certain inventory to the amount we anticipate receiving upon vehicle sale after considering future costs necessary to ready the inventory for sale. This expense negatively impacted gross profit in the fourth quarter, and we expect it to also impact upcoming quarters in the near term. Turning to operating expenses, research and development expense for the quarter was $726 million, as compared to $255 million in the fourth quarter of 2020. The increased spend stemmed from our current and future vehicle programs, as well as cross-platform technology. As RJ mentioned, we have kicked off our in-house motor system, standard range LFP battery pack, Rivian cloud architecture, and many other hardware and software technologies that will allow us to introduce more accessible price points improve gross margins, and enable us to expand our high-margin, lifetime software and services revenue opportunity. 
Finally, we realized stock-based compensation expense of $277 million in the fourth quarter of 2021. As a reminder, our stock-based compensation vesting conditions were deemed probable at IPO, resulting in the recognition of our first stock-based compensation expense in Q4 2021. SG&A expense for the fourth quarter of 2021 was $682 million, as compared to $98 million for the fourth quarter of 2020. As we scale our production, it's important we also scale our commercial operations, providing a seamless, comprehensive consumer solution is part of what customers expect when purchasing a Rivian vehicle. This requires investment in our digital experience, customer engagement and delivery teams, service operations, and customer-facing facilities and events. In addition, we continue to focus on attracting new talent that will help us grow and reach our long-term objectives. We realized $277 million in stock-based compensation associated with SG&A. In Q4 2021, we also recorded other expense. Hey guys, 370 watching. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe, guys. Really helps us out. Everything we do is for free. Accounting for the 8 million shares of Class A common stock and 20 million of cash that was donated to Forever by Rivian Inc. in conjunction with our IPO. Our capital expenditures for the fourth quarter were $455 million, driven by our continued strategic investments in infrastructure. The capital expenditures were primarily due to expansion of our normal factory, as well as investments in corporate facilities, service operations, and experience spaces. We have created a tremendous ecosystem, bringing together our in-vehicle in technology, the Rivian Cloud, and our product development and operations infrastructure that support our launch products and services and build the foundation for growth. We are at the tipping point of the EV transformation. We play in the fastest growing and most profitable market segment and will continue to scale our offerings with new price points, use cases, and form factors. During the fourth quarter, we completed our initial public offering, which provided us capital to help execute our near-term roadmap. We ended the year with $18.4 billion of cash on hand which includes restricted cash. As we look forward to 2022, I wanted to reiterate our excitement for the opportunities ahead and continued improvement in the areas of our business that we can control. Our primary focus will be to ramp our normal facility and the production of our R1 and RCD platforms. While we work diligently to alleviate any supply chain challenges, we believe that through 2022, the supply chain will be the fundamental limiting factor to our total output for the year. We believe our normal facility, manufacturing equipment, and processes have the ability to produce approximately 50,000 vehicles across our R1 and RCD platforms in 2022 if we were not constrained by our supply chain. Our confidence comes from weeks of batch building that have proven our processes and equipment are ramping as we had expected and intended. Despite this, due to the supply chain constraints, which are currently visible to us, in 2022, we plan to produce 25,000 vehicles across our R1 and RCD platform. Our estimated adjusted EBITDA for 2022 is negative $4.75 billion, primarily due to continued forward investment. We will increase our research and development expense through investments in future vehicle platforms, vertical integration of shared technologies, as well as our in-vehicle and Rivian Cloud technology roadmap. Our SG&A expense will increase primarily due to expected investments in our technology and commercial organization. As more of our vehicles hit the road, it's important we continue to invest in all aspects of our business that make the digital first ownership experience seamless and enjoyable. We plan to continue investing in our business throughout 2022 and therefore expect an increase in capital expenditures as compared to 2021. Capital expenditures are expected to be $2.6 billion driven by additional investment in our normal factory to expand the capacity of our R1 line to over 100,000 units annually. 
In addition, we expect to realize increased capital spend associated with the tooling for current vehicle platforms, future vehicle manufacturing lines, battery technology and supply, our service network, digital offering, and general technology. In closing, I wanted to reiterate our excitement for what we have ahead of us. Our long-term targets remain unchanged with gross margin targets of 25%, EBITDA margin targets in the high teens, and free cash flow margin targets of 10%. We expect the capital we are investing today will deliver powerful returns on investment. While the past year was filled with so many incredible milestones, we are truly just getting started. With that, let me turn the call back to RJ before opening up the line for Q&A. Thanks, Claire. We are no doubt experiencing one of the most challenging supply chain environments the automotive industry has ever seen. But as we look out 10 years from now, our products, our technology, and our brand platform will help us capture substantial market share in the transportation space. I want to thank everybody for being with us today. And with that, let me turn it over to the operator for questions. Thank you. And as a reminder, to ask a question, simply press star 1 on your telephone. And to withdraw the question, press the hash or the pound key. Please stand by. First question is from Adam Jonas with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks, everybody. Um, so, RJ and Claire. Uh, Jesus. During, in your I hope that wasn't as loud for you guys here, as it was for me. Uh, you had, at the time, 55,400 orders for the R1. And... You stated that you expected to deliver those vehicles uh, by late 2023. Can you confidently reiterate that you could deliver the 55,000th R1 by late 2023 today? Welcome back, John. Hi, Adam. Uh, yeah, we can we can confidently say we'd be able to deliver the 55, uh, 50, was the 55,000th vehicle by the end of 2023. And as you heard from Claire and I, right now, you know, the real constraint for our production is within su the supply chain. And this has been a, a major focus for us. The, you know, every morning starts uh, with thinking about uh, which suppliers we need to go uh, speak to and push harder on to make sure they're ramping as fast as the rest of our production line. All right, Bobby, I'm here, brother. You can get out of here, dude. Uh, our ability to ramp this year will we'll continue to be gated by the supplier ramps. And as you know, it's not. Hey, thanks for holding it down. But everybody, thank Bobby. All fraction of the bill of materials where we're having some of these supplier constraints. It's fun hanging out with you guys. Yeah, man. Okay. Uh, RJ, I'm Good luck in the competition. Added. Good luck. Yeah. You, you confidently much. reiterate that given your visibility on the supply constraints. Um, just This is how I'm interpreting that, I mean, including the, comply, the supply constraints. Ab absolutely. And okay. yeah, absolutely. as you know, it's not all the bill of materials. It's just a small fraction of the bill of materials where we're having some of these supplier constraints. Okay, uh, RJ, I'm, I'm interpreting that as that you you confidently reiter reiterate that given your visibility on the supply constraints. Um, just this is how I'm interpreting that, I meaning including the comply the supply constraints. Ab absolutely. And okay, yeah, absolutely. Great. Thanks, RJ. Just as a follow-up, how many EDVs have you delivered to Amazon to date? Have actually, you know, been delivered and are in service? So, as as you heard, Adam, we're in the process on EDV of ramping the production, and the production ramp on that vehicle is actually going a lot smoother than what we've seen on R1, and it's really uh, capturing a lot of the lessons learned and a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, the, the sort of organizational capabilities that we built on the ramp up of R1. And so as we think about EDV, it is it is outrunning the supply chain uh, by a significant degree to get today. So the vehicles that we're producing, we're using really to refine, uh, as you heard from us, some of the software and integration, the, the digital integration within Amazon system. Uh, so we really look to the second quarter to see significant ramp up of the EDV. Okay, RJ, thanks for that. So I'm, I'm interpreting that as there really aren't any significant numbers in the fleet right now. They're being built and, and upfitted and, and improved and optimized in the factory, and we won't expect any, I won't expect any material amount of EDV deliveries. I won't see them on in neighborhoods delivering packages, for example, until sometime in the second quarter. Is that incorrect? Is that correct? Well, I guess it depends on which neighborhoods you're in, but... Uh... 
right now we have a number of vehicles that are deployed as part of this uh, testing and pilot fleet. But right. uh, in terms of significant scale, that's right. We wouldn't see significant scale until second quarter of this year. Mm. Thanks, RJ. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Murphy with Bank of America. Your line is open. Good afternoon, guys. Um, maybe just to push a, a little bit harder on, on this on this volume number. I mean, RJ, as you look at the, the supply disruption right now, I wonder if you could give us maybe a little bit more color about, you know, specific parts. Is it semis or, you know, we've heard, you know, just, you know, general malaise and, and snarl in, in supply chains. And, and then two, what you think this means ultimately for volume expectations as we get beyond uh, 2022 into 2023? Because I think generally there's a, an expectation to do 100,000 units plus in 2023. So, I mean, you, you know, I mean, I, you're talking about capacity to do 50,000 units right now on a tooled basis. I mean, do you think on a tooled basis, the supply chain gets issues get worked out that you could do something like 100,000 units in 2023. Yeah, thanks, John. We're we're working as hard as we can to get the suppliers ramped. And um, as you said, certainly uh, the vast majority of our suppliers have been re- keeping up with the production ramp in the plant. And as, as the production rates continue to increase within our facility, uh, the constraints within the supply base become even more apparent. And we have resources focused on any of those constraints to make sure we do everything we possibly can to to expand um, to expand our component supply. Because ultimately, our you know, our goal is to deliver as many vehicles as we possibly can this year. And as you heard from Claire, uh, you know, we're not for supplier constraints. We're confident we could achieve in excess of 50,000 vehicles this year. So what we've uh, what we've done is on these these few areas where we do have constraints. Uh, we're working uh, very closely, meaning we have our teams on site with those suppliers, uh, in some cases, helping to operate the certain shifts. In other cases, where we've had third parties that are coming in uh, to help improve the efficiency and the efficacy of those of those operations. But the the areas that I, I just point to that, that we're seeing more challenge in as we ramp uh, really are within the semiconductor space, uh, the wire harness space, and within the electronic space at some of the CMs, the contract manufacturers that are building uh, the, the printed circuit boards for us. And so in each of those, there's different constraints. Uh, as you can imagine in the semiconductor space, a lot of that's dealing with allocation. In the harness space, for our case, these harnesses are coming uh, out of Mexico. There's a number of labor challenges there, uh, many of which have been, have been exacerbated by COVID. Uh, and that's very similar to some of the compute platforms as we start to get to much higher volumes. There's a bit of a ripple effect of some of the component shortages that then feed into the assembly of those components into, into printed circuit boards. Okay, that, that's very helpful. And then just a second question on the pri- pricing kerfuffle. I mean, I, I think you guys have, um, you know, from my personal view, underpriced your product, you know, e- even before supply chain issues and inflation and everything, because you have a very, very good product. So I think you kind of underestimated your own success here. Um, you know, have you read anything into the folks that you haven't heard complain about the price increases and the people that have still ordered after the price increases? And do you think, forget about, you know, the, the input cost inflation, that there might be even more opportunity on pricing on your vehicle? Because I mean, from my vantage point, you're a high-end, you know, Jeep Wrangler to somewhere uh, where a high-end, you know, Range Rover, and I, I think you you really have kind of maybe undershot structurally what you could do on pricing. Forget about you know market dynamics, um, you know, at the moment, just based on the product itself. So I mean, you know, one, you know, what have you read from the people you haven't heard to the people you 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 know have, have ordered post pricing increases? And three, do you think there might be even more room on pricing just because of the product itself? What? John, we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at our pricing model, and uh, as you heard from me, a, a big part of the new pricing model uh, was to make sure we could uh, really ingest our dual motor and our standard battery pack within our price range, as you heard, from $67,500 uh, up through uh, yeah, 90 plus thousand dollars And so with that now portfolio of three different drive or three different battery packs and two different drive, con- uh, drive configurations, uh, we have a really nice uh, mix of options for customers and mix of configurations for customers. And when you take a step back and look at the product at the new pricing levels, it is very competitively priced. Uh, if you look at our SUV, uh, this is a three-row SUV with a large pack 
and the dual motor, it's zero to 60 in under four seconds, uh, over 320 miles in range, a true proper three row vehicle with a lot of space for storage. Uh, you know, I've been driving one now for over three months. Incredibly fun. My wife and I love it. I mean, the products themselves, as you said, are exceptional and we are seeing tremendous demand. Now, since announcing the new pricing, we've also seen really no change in uh, the rate at which pre-orders are coming in. And so customers also really see the value proposition uh, and it's really been validated and confirmed um, you know, over the last week by seeing the, the continued influx of demand and, and as, uh, as we like to think about it, the, the continued growing backlog of, of demand. Okay, that's great. Yeah, no, I just think there's. I think you. I think you may even have more room than 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 you think. But um, you know, that's a high class problem to have. Um, thanks so much for the time. Thanks, John. Thank you. Your next question comes from Rod Lackey with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hi, everybody. Um, just on the supplier issues, I, I understand the types of things that you're doing to help suppliers, but can you give us a sense of the visibility? Um, into bringing those constrained suppliers into w where they need to be. So the, the suppliers of semis and wire harnesses and electronics that that are an issue are they are they giving you a a uh, kind of a high confidence schedule at this point and and uh, just give us a sense of the you know what what that what that looks like. Yeah, thanks, Rod. It it really depends on the the commodity area and on the supplier. Uh, and something like a wire harness or uh, an ECU that's being built at a CM at a contract manufacturer. Uh, in those situations, we have teams that are on site. We have very, uh, you know, incredibly high, an incredible high level of visibility into their operations, into the into the way in which they're running their business, uh, and we have very close and transparent relationships with them. And on those, uh, we're able to essentially build crisp line of sight over the next um, you know, several quarters of production. Now, with that said, uh, the challenge within the semiconductor space is there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more unknowns there. And uh, it's very different than let's say a wire harness production facility where we can put team members on the ground at the wire harness facility where we can actually help, we can actually assess. Um, we're not able to send folks into foundries or send folks into uh, semiconductor manufacturing sites to do the same type of hands-on uh, support and or auditing. So in that regard, uh, I, I'm spending a lot of time and the rest of our uh, senior leadership team is spending a lot of time with our semiconductor suppliers and making sure we're securing the right allocation. And that allocation as we start to get into higher, uh, higher production rates, especially in the back half of this year is where we've, um, where we see risk and it's, it's what's caused us to make the adjustments, uh, to what we're guiding to in terms of, in terms of production for this year. But I want to be very, very clear. Uh, we are pushing very hard on those suppliers. And if any of those suppliers are listening in here, uh, you're going to continue to, those suppliers will continue to hear from us. And we're going to be continuing to push very hard to get those numbers as high as possible because they are constraining us. And it, it's quite painful when we see our production if I plans, constrained, uh, really ramping and time. the lines running as we intend uh, to, to have to throttle production because of those shortages of those parts. So, so this is something we're, we're laser focused on, uh, you know, uh, a mooring doesn't go by where it's not a, a topic of a conversation uh, for us as a management team. Okay. Um, and, and you said that you're now at 2X, the uh, 2021 exit rate of production. Can you just tell us specifically what that means? You know, what, what is the production per day and um, what kind of cadence are you expecting over the course of this year. So, so if I look at 50,000 units a year, that looks like it would correspond eventually to something like 170 per week on a, um, or 170 a day on a six, uh, six day week and, and 50 weeks a year. Do you, do you think you would get there towards the end of this year? Again, it, it ultimately the rate at which we can produce is gonna be gated by the, the number of components that we have. One of the things that's given us uh, the confidence around the production ramp is, is the way we've been validating our production equipment, production lines, and also making sure we're uh, training our teams well, is accumulating enough parts to run the lines at their intended rate. 
Uh, so we may have, you know, we may have a not run one day during the week, or we may finish a shift early uh, because we're we're operating the lines at at, at a much higher rate. Uh, so because of that, you know, we're, we're our lines are are sitting still far far more often than we'd like because we're waiting on components. So that gives us the 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 confidence to, to state here that we see the ramp continuing to improve, but it is going or continuing to uh, continue to climb, but it's going to be limited, as I said, uh, by by unlocking some of these key components. Okay, um, but but there there surely is some schedule that you have in your own mind and and you know embedded in that twenty five thousand unit forecast. Can you just give us a sense of what that cadence look like looks like just so that we can get a sense of of what your expectations are for the ramp of your suppliers so, so uh, as, as you said we we're running at twice the rate of what our exit velocity was or exit rate was uh, for 2021 um, we will continue to climb but ultimately uh, that 25,000 implies uh, that that we're up against the ceiling of supply if you will Mm -hmm. But that that ceiling is something we're working very hard to uh, to remove so that we can continue ramping and continue getting uh, more vehicles to customers. Okay. Just, to, and just, just chime in and provide a little bit more color on that point um, as well. As we think through the volumes for the year, would expect that those volumes would be more back half weighted as we think about where we are in the S curve today and the trajectory of of the manufacturing plant and making sure that our supply chain partners are also ramping you know, their weekly output in lockstep with, with Rivian so that we can hold uh, the, the rate that the production facility can, um, can deliver across the board. And so as we think about the cadence of, of the quarters for the year, I uh, would think about us you know, in this next quarter and you know, closing out Q1 and, and moving into Q2, uh, starting to, to prioritize more of those R1S builds, and so would, would that's sort of also uh, part and parcel of slope of the curve that you could expect as you see us accelerating into the back half of the year. And the other important uh, dimension here as well is, is really the cadence of uh, the RCV platform as well. Uh, given some of the seasonality of Amazon, uh, there's a heavy push for us to, to really ramp production throughout the course of Q2 and Q3, uh, and then taper as, as they think about sort of their, their high season, which is sort of heading into that holiday period. Uh, so very much kind of a, a big push as, as we think about uh, building up production into Q3 uh, to, to deliver on that uh, 25,000 plus units. Okay, uh, just to clarify, two, two times your production rate from the exit rate, are, are you talking something like 50 or 60 a day, just to, to put some kind of a, a metric on, on where you're running right now. Can you share that? I would just say, Rod, we're, we're not going to get into the habit of providing, you know, daily production rates. And I think as you as you rightfully have, have seen, you know, on, on our last earnings call, we gave you, you know, numbers and you can you could sort of benchmark and tell uh, the overall uh, daily production in those last handful of weeks of, of, yeah. of last quarter. Uh, but just wanted to make sure we were providing sort of that overall uh, visibility into the progress we're making. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. And your next question comes from Ryan Brinkman with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, relative to the earlier planned 17 to 20% price increase for current reservation holders, is this price increase needed to offset inflationary pressure since the time of the IPO in order to meet the financial expectations you may have had at that time? Uh, and does that imply then that margin might now be lower than previously contemplated, at least until such time as you begin selling uh, the new orders that you take at the higher price? Uh, and does this mean that uh, prices, yeah, in the out years will now uh, be higher than previously contemplated, which could imply that volumes might be uh, lower than previously contemplated, or or maybe because there's a, a general inflationary environment, including for battery metals and, and competitor vehicles too, that does that kind of offset the impact of volume? How, how are you thinking about these different factors? Sure, as as you as your question indicates, there are many different factors that are driving um, what we've both experienced over the last handful of months uh, in regards to the inflationary pressures, you know, in the market. 
Um, but I, I think as, as you heard in, in John's question as well, right, there's still a, a phenomenal value proposition for the vehicles, even at the revised pricing levels that, that we put out uh, to the market, uh, which again is, as, as RJ mentioned and, and touched upon, is really reinforced uh, by the overall demand that we've seen uh, post pricing increase, you know, for those vehicles across the board. And as we think about, you know, what's changed um, since that time of, of IPO, right, we have both the, the, the largest factor here in these early stages of production is actually volume and rate. And so as you think about the fact that we have 150,000 units of annualized capacity at our plant in normal Illinois, and instead of you know, higher volumes, as we had indicated, right, we have the ability to produce 50,000 units this year. Uh, the fact that we're supply constrained to 25,000 units uh, this year is actually the most uh, highly sensitive variable as you think about the impact on our gross margin. And so this, the supply chain environment is a key factor in regards to uh, the margin rate that we expect to have. Uh, inflation also has, you know, clearly been an, a factor here as, as well. Uh, Rivian is not alone in, in regards to the overall uh, raw material input prices that, that are obviously impacting uh, EVs across the board and will continue to, to impact the space overall. I think that the important takeaway here is Right. Our long-term targets are unchanged. We still have tremendous conviction around our ability to deliver against our 25% uh, long-term gross profit margin. And you know, we'll continue to see that opportunity. And importantly, as we think about the, the components of that margin, as we've talked about in the past, it's not just the, the vehicles we're providing, but importantly, it's the software and services and recurring revenue streams that we can earn a uh, post initial purchase that helps us deliver that 25% margin and the opportunity to move over time, you know, even beyond those levels. So in, Maybe. in closing, I would, I would just say that, right, we, we feel as though our, our vehicles are competitively priced today. We see tremendous demand uh, in that backdrop. And as we look at the long term, uh, we see really no change to the overall uh, margin trajectory and, and opportunity we have. Great to hear. Thanks so much. And then just lastly, what are your thoughts on that battery and metals cost inflation? How do you think, uh, you know, the increase in the price of nickel, uh, which seems like it could be hopefully in large part temporary, but some That's of the other metals question, too, yeah. how do you think uh, that impacts the competitiveness of EVs versus ICE vehicles, understanding too that ICE vehicles have their own palladium and platinum and catalytic converter inflation problem to worry about as well. Uh, do you have a sense for how these like competing inflationary uh, cost pressures might net out and what the resulting impact could be on EV sales or EV penetration of total industry sales? Oh, he snuck this on them. Ron, as sure. you said, we, you know, we hope the, the <laughs> inflation that we've seen with nickel pricing very recently is short-lived. Um, but but the reality is that there's going to continue to be movements around commodity pricing, uh, and it's going to be across a variety of commodities. Um, you know, whether you're looking at uh, some of the commodities that go into catalysts, as, as you said, in an ICE vehicle versus, let's say, nickel and, and a battery cell. But I'd also point out, and, and I talked about this earlier, uh, that we're developing a portfolio of battery solutions inclusive of lithium iron phosphate and LFP pack. And, and one of the nice things about having uh, multiple different chemistries across our portfolio is it, it essentially provides a bit of a hedge around some of the uh, different materials that go into different battery chemistries, in this case, of course, uh, referring to nickel. Uh, but these are this is something we're paying very close attention to. Uh, we fully recognize uh, and fully uh, analyze the implications of, of some of these different materials and the the pricing of those materials, how that will be translated into a margin structure. Yeah, it depends on what their margins Very are. Very helpful. Really. Thank you. All right, guys. Um, all right, guys. So we're going to go ahead and close it down there. Um, it, it genuinely depends on their margin, how much the nickel factor is going to affect future profitability. It really depends on what their margins are, how good their margins are, how bad their margins are. Uh, nickel is certainly relevant to battery production. Don't get it twisted. They might say otherwise, but that nickel issue is certainly relevant to their long-term profitability and we'll have to see what happens if you haven't already hit the subscribe button hit the notification bell we do this live every day for free right here on youtube um 
we got to close it down, guys. So good luck in the markets. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. We're going to be uh, trading live with our $30,000 account tomorrow morning like we always do. So hit the notification bell and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Good luck.